it already feels so settled and conducive, and, and that's really beautiful. So I feel privileged, really, to be able to uh, sit with you all, and of course to have Ajahn Brahmali to guide us. So thank you, Ajahn Brahmali. And I don't think you need a lot of introduction, but I just want to introduce you out of respect and genuine gratitude, really, as a really wonderful teacher of, of Buddhism who teaches with such integrity and intellectual honesty and also based on many, many years of practice and guidance from Ajahn Ram, who's uh, both our teachers and also in Bulupeka, who's with us from Perth. She's also in Damasara Monastery, uh, which is part of the monastery um, group that Ajahn Brahm has developed and that is now independent as a community for bhikkhunis for fully ordained nuns. And uh, so we have some really wonderful monastic sangha here. And it's a total privilege for me to have Ajahn Brahmali come. We tried to organize this a few times since you were last here five years ago, but um, because of the corona pandemic, obviously we couldn't meet in person. So it's just Great to have you here now, and uh, just want to really express um, my appreciation of you as a, a big brother, really, on the path. I can give you that way, so it's been great fun so far, hanging out together. And um, yeah, just just the opportunity, you know, to have somebody who's so supportive of what we're doing as a project as well. So Ajahn Ramal is also one of our unofficial advisors, but I think you have given me a lot of good advice over the years. And so he's really here to support uh, to support what we're doing in England as well as teach the Dhamma. So thank you very much for coming so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone. So uh, welcome, 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 welcome. And uh, thank you for your kind invitation on the Bhattanda. I just have to return the compliments. It's nice to be here again. Mm -hmm. And always nice to see some familiar faces, people I know from before. It's just marvellous. <laughs> And uh, so it's good to be in. It's a beautiful place here. I, I used to live in the UK uh, uh, many years ago. My, f my family was very Anglophile. They loved the UK here. And, uh, you know, and so I also must admit it's very beautiful here. Uh, and it's very kind of a soothing landscape, a nice meditation landscape with the rolling hills, the greenery and all of these things. Uh, when you come from Perth, uh, England is like a green heaven. <laughs> Australia is like a desert, desert place and very dry and very, uh, very different from here. Uh, there's also kind of beauty to it, but it's very different from here. Uh. So it's good to be here again and uh, hopefully we will have a good time together here. Uh. Have you come here to have a good time or not to have a good time? <laughs> if you have not come to have a good time, you're in the wrong place. Sir. So, <laughs> this is kind of the one. Of okay. The, the, for me, the one of one of um, meditation practice is to enjoy what we're doing here. And uh, for me, it is always the case that the whole purpose of the spiritual path uh, is to enhance our quality of life, not to kind of detract from the quality of life. Uh. And for a lot of people in the world, the way they practice spiritual life, the way they do the meditation is such that actually it leads to a deterioration of the quality of life because it is too harsh, it is too much willpower, there's too much pain, there's too much mental agony sometimes. And there are certain meditation centers where they say that 90% of people never return after the meditation simply because the system is not really rigged for ordinary people to succeed. And so please don't make that mistake. Make sure that you enjoy yourself. This is kind of the basic idea of this whole retreat. And I will come back to this later on, how to do that, how to make sure you have a good time and that you can relax properly. And when you live here after seven days, hopefully you have a smile on your face. And if not, then I'm the one who is to blame. <laughs> so, or, <laughs> the pressure is on me here. I don't feel a lot of pressure, but I, anyway, the pressure is still, I guess, there somehow. The eight precepts are the Atta Sila in the Pali language, and they are basically uh, fundamentally about morality, but they're also, interestingly, about restraint and about renunciation. There's two aspects of these eight precepts. But the most important part of it is the morality part. Yeah? So the, uh, the first precept is about not killing living beings. Uh, and that includes uh, irritating mosquitoes in your bedroom. Uh, yeah, that's a hard one. Uh, that's one of the most difficult ones. Uh, is anyone who has problems sleeping if there's a mosquito buzzing in the bedroom? Uh, <laughs> 
as one of those tricky ones. You have to have a lot of compassion to kind of overcome that uh, uh, kind of human tendency to want to annihilate such mosquitoes. Uh, so, but uh, once you develop a bit of compassion, you will see that actually it doesn't make any sense to kill even a mosquito in that kind of situation. Uh, you have the uh, adinadana, which is not stealing. Uh, yeah, so basically you're being you get the idea with that. Uh, then you have the Abramacharya, which is one of the kind of really strict things on a retreat like this. Uh, and this basically means no sexual activity uh, during this uh, seven days. Uh, then you have the Musavada, uh, not lying. Uh, yeah, And because we are supposed to be on noble silence, then lying is going to be hard. Uh, yeah, unless you lie through your bodily conduct, but you are gonna, it's going to be more difficult. So it's kind of, sometimes it's good to be silent because it takes away some of these... Uh, things where we often can go wrong. Yeah, yeah speech can be a tricky area huh? and uh, so lying is very important. Uh, well, not lying is very important rather. <laughs> 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 and uh, one of the uh, things that I should maybe say a little bit about this idea of silence on the retreat, uh, and this is often called noble silence uh, in the um, uh, in the suttas, uh, yeah, and uh, the idea of noble silence is supposed to be something positive, uh, something that enhances the meditation experience and enhances the whole experience of the retreat. Uh, and so don't make it to something that is painful, uh, something that is um, kind of oppressive in a way. Yeah, I've got to be silent or can't talk or okay, feel oppressed by it. Uh, if it is oppressive, uh, it is counterproductive. Uh, so make it into something that is uh, kind of light and easy. Uh, and one of the ways that I like to think of noble silence, it, it's like a gift uh, to all the people around you. Uh, yeah? Everyone here, everyone is here to be silent, to practice the meditation. If you are silent, uh, yeah, don't speak or even be gentle with the way you, you know, you'll slam the doors too hard, that kind of thing. Uh, then you are supporting everyone else. You're giving them a gift uh, through your silence. Uh, and then you make it into something positive. Uh, it doesn't feel oppressive. Uh, now, for those of you who are used to retreats, probably no problem at all, but for those of you who are not so used to it, uh, it can be a bit tricky to be silent, not really used to being silent for long periods of time. Uh, if you really need to speak to somebody, uh, you're always welcome to ask to speak to myself. Uh, I guess Shell also would be uh, necessary. Yeah, Shell, yeah, there you are. Okay, I found you there. Yeah. And uh, so that is, uh, so that, you know, you don't, if you, you know, if something happens that is very uncomfortable or whatever, uh, you have someone you can talk to. Uh, um, so those are the uh, precepts about uh, morality, uh, but one of the things about morality is that it is very supportive of meditation practice. Uh, yeah, the Buddha talks about two things in the sutta that are supportive of meditation. Those two things are morality uh, and right view, uh, ujjukaditti and sila. Uh, now we'll talk about these things in much more detail later on because they're actually very, very interesting areas. Uh, and Buddhist morality is different from almost any other morality in the world. It is much more detailed, it's much more refined. It is much more onerous to practice Buddhist morality. It sets the bar very, very high if you want to live according to Buddhist morality all the time. And uh, so the way to think about Buddhist morality uh, yeah, is to remember that it is not just about not doing the bad things, uh, the, all the things I talked about now were just bad things, right? Don't kill, don't steal, okay, this is all good. But actually, to really, if you want to live a full Buddhist life in terms of morality and who you are as a person, uh, you should act with kindness as well. Uh. It's not just about avoiding the bad, but doing the good deliberately. Uh. And this is the idea of, then, of being generous with your speech, yeah? having noble silence, making it to something very positive, uh, when you're actually giving a gift to someone else. Uh, and if you give a gift to someone else, uh, that is very supportive of your meditation. Uh. So if you feel that you have done the right thing yeah, around other people, uh, and then you sit down, uh, you will feel good about yourself. Uh. And if you do slam the door a bit, you know, especially if you're a bit upset, you do it on purpose, well, then you feel really, really bad about yourself afterwards. Uh, so hopefully you want, I'm, I'm sure you won't do that. I'm just kind of make, get, you know, I don't know, nobody here is like that. I know that, but just as an example, uh, you know what it's like sometimes. Uh. And uh, so that is the idea of morality. And even your meditation practice, uh, you can make that an act of generosity. Uh. Yeah, if you sit down in the beginning and you meditate, you think, I'm doing this not just for myself, but for the whole world. Uh. It's very powerful. Uh. 
Because if you're giving your meditation to others and you know that you become a better person when you become peaceful, uh, when you kind of settle down, uh, when you develop a bright mind, uh, yeah, and you kind of get a soft and gentle heart, yeah, these things are very positive, not just for you, but also for the people around you. Uh. So your meditation actually is a gift for the world. So bring that to mind at the beginning. Uh, I'm doing this for everyone. Uh. And this is how you actually enable meditation practice, yeah, by having these kind of positive attitudes uh, in everything you do. Uh. And so this is kind of the morality aspect. It's incredibly important to get this right on this path, uh, especially, uh, especially on this retreat. Uh. One of the things about uh, morality uh, is that uh, it's very easy when we are so close together sometimes to irritate each other a little bit, yeah? yeah? I like to say that everybody is irritating here. Yeah? Everyone is irritating, right? We're all irritating here. Yeah? I am sometimes irritating here. Yeah? And, uh, and the reason is, it's not because we are bad people, it's just that we are different from others. Yeah? And we do things in our own idiosyncratic way, we have our own perceptions, yeah? and there will be people who see us as irritating, just as other people irritate us. Yeah? Everyone is irritating here. Yeah? And so to because of that, uh, it can, when we live close together, it's very easy for sometimes for these little frictions to arise, yeah, because people do things or whatever. Uh. So, because of that, uh, it is very important to establish a positive perception uh, of all the people here on this retreat. Uh. And actually, it is quite easy to do that, uh, yeah, because everyone who is here is a good person. Uh. No one comes on this retreat if they are a really dodgy character. Uh. Yeah, dodgy characters don't do it, don't take eight precepts, yeah, because they, they don't want to do that. Uh, usually at this point I usually ask if there are any bad people, but I'm not even going to bother with that this time, because uh, I know this, I know the answer already. Yeah, yeah so the, everyone here is a, someone who, at the very least, uh, is inclining towards something positive. Their intention is pos very positive, at the very least, uh, and that is worthy of an enormous amount of respect. Uh, and so remember that idea that the people around you are really good people. These are the kind of, uh, these are, so, and when you remember that, then whenever someone does something slightly silly or they forget, they lose their mindfulness a little bit or whatever, uh, you can forgive straight away. Uh, because you know, these are the kind of people that you, uh, you actually do respect deep down uh, because they're doing the right thing for themselves and for others. Uh. And this is very important to have a smooth retreat uh, when we kind of work together in this way. Uh. And this is part of the Buddhist idea of morality, yeah? the morality of the mind. And this is where Buddhism kind of stands out in the, uh, the world of morality and spirituality and religion, that we take the idea of morality to a very deep level. Uh, and we include the mind itself. Uh. So have this gentleness and the kindness to the people around you. Then you're going to be on the right track. Yeah? Then there is the idea of not uh, drinking here. Yeah? Any alcohol? I don't, I don't think there's going to be... You're going to serve any wine to, for the meals? No, no, no wine for the meals, so that you, you should be okay. Uh, and no beer either or anything else. Uh, but of course the idea of not drinking is the idea of clarity. Yeah? The idea of having a clear mind, uh, knowing what you're doing, being mindful, these kind of things. Uh, that's the opposite. Uh, and uh, drinking is not very helpful for these things. Uh. So uh, that is, uh, drinking is out, drugs are pretty much out, uh, uh, coffee is okay. I have to say that because I drink lots of coffee, yeah. so, <laughs> I, so <laughs> lots of good monks drink good coffee. I'm not saying I'm a good monk, I'm saying many good monks, other monks drink, yeah, or, and nuns for that matter drink a lot of coffee, so, uh, and tea and, and other kind of uh, stimulants if you like. Yeah. Uh, then there is the uh, precept about not uh, eating in the afternoon. Uh, yeah. And uh, this is where we start to get into the idea of restraint and renunciations. There will be a little bit of renunciation on this retreat. Uh, and one of those things is not to eat in the afternoon. But I think there will be, there will be some little things available that are right, Shell? Uh, in, oh, the, sorry, in, the in the evening? Yeah. No, nothing. In, no? Not sure. Any drinks? Tea? Tea? What is available? Tea? tea, tea. Day, yeah. Um, and with sugar and things? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so if you need a little, little, little energy, okay, good. Okay, so that's what how it's going to be. Okay, good. So, uh, and uh, and don't be afraid of not eating in the afternoon, right? I know that there are some people that get really afraid about this, uh, and then they eat for lunch, and they eat this enormous lunch, and then sleep all <laughs> afternoon, right? Because they're so afraid of going hungry in the evening. Yeah. But I guarantee you will be fine. Uh, 
And I, I must admit, I always feel a bit, a bit sorry for all the lay people who come for the eight precepts because you're not used to not eating in the afternoon, right? Uh, for you guys, it's actually it's a change. Uh, for people like myself who haven't been to eating in the afternoon for 30 years, uh, if you try to make me eat in the afternoon, I, I won't have it because it's just so out of, you know, I just can't, can't take it anymore. Uh. But for you people, for all of you, actually, it is quite hard. So be kind to yourself. Have a nice breakfast and then share it out with the, uh, uh, the meal at the midday. And uh, get up early, go early to bed if you can. I don't know what, what, what kind of rhythm, body rhythm you have. And then you kind of you sort it out in a way that actually makes it work quite nicely. But uh, the idea is to renounce a little bit in the world of the five senses. <coughs> And this is a very important aspect of the whole idea of Buddhist meditation. Uh, because the world of the five senses takes the mind out. Uh, yeah? it, takes, it moves the mind out into the world. And the mind which goes out into the world uh, is not the mind which is able to stabilize within uh, and stay, stay inside. Uh. So there is like, either the mind goes out or it stays within her. And if we have too much attachment to the world outside, too much desires in that world, you will not really be able to reach the full stages of samadhi and stillness in meditation. We want to move now in a different direction to go within her. So either the mind goes out or it goes within. It can't really do both at the same time. And that's why we have these ideas of restraint uh, uh, as part of the idea of meditation. So in the evening, try not to think too much about food. Yeah, this can happen very easily. I don't know, there is a nice sutta which I like always like to quote. This is from uh, Lady Visaka, the, one of the Buddha's, uh, maybe the Buddha's chief female lay disciple. Uh, and uh, she would always, uh, when she would ask the Buddha, she would come for the Uposita, the Uposita is like the full moon day in the monastery, and she would ask the Buddha, yeah, these are really good questions. It's a simple but good question. How should you practice the Uposatha in the right way? Yeah? And then the Buddha says, well, you know, some people, they come to the Uposatha, huh? yeah, and they keep the eight precepts. Uh, and then in the evening, yeah, of that Uposatha day, when they, there's no entertainment, the bed is really simple, there's no food, uh, and all they do is they think about tomorrow, I'm going to make food like this. Whoa, and they're kind of they're <laughs> salivating, yeah, and they're thinking about this beautiful food they're going to have the next day or whatever, yeah. This is the Buddha said, this is the wrong way yeah, of doing the eight precepts. So, so um, this is, uh, so try to avoid that. Uh, yeah? This is kind of what you want to avoid. And if you can avoid that, uh, then you are fine. Uh, that means that you don't have a problem with food. Uh, don't try to eat in a kind of very special way and kind of enjoy your meals. Uh, if you enjoy your meals and you eat enough and you feel nice and full when you're finished, uh, you will find you will not tend to think about food in the afternoon. Uh, it's not going to be a problem there. Uh, so you will be okay here. Yeah. A little bit of renunciation here. Yeah. And the same thing with the seventh precept, which you all you did. Actually, I was very I was very impressed with you. This long long one, Natchagita Vadita Visukadasana Malaganda Vidana Mandrapsa. This one there. Yeah. This is all about entertainment and beautifying the body here. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the nice things about being on a retreat is that you Kind of, you want to disappear a little bit. Uh, you don't want to stand out. Or you don't want to shout to the world, here I am. Yeah? This is what we normally want to do in the world. People want to say, here I am. We want to kind of, our ego demands that we are seen by the world yeah, in one way or another. Yeah? And uh, here it's about kind of disappearing. And it feels really nice when you disappear. Yeah? It's like you are not anything to anyone. Uh, you just kind of go through the day. Yeah? And uh, the elimination of the sense of self is obviously a very important part of the Buddhist path. Uh, and it's very helpful in meditation. Uh, some of the subtle defilements that you find in meditation are driven by the sense of self. Uh, wanting to express itself. Uh, wanting to say, here I am. Uh, yeah? Thinking, you will, sometimes you will find that you think about uh, things like your you know, relationships with other people, your status, and that kind of thing. That these things will come into your mind. Uh, and it's because the sense of self wants to exert itself. Uh. So this idea of disappearing, yeah? Wearing simple clothes, uh, no kind of jewelry and makeup and these kind of things, and just being kind of natural. Uh, actually, there's something very beautiful about that. Uh, not having to be anyone for anyone else. Uh, not, having, not caring what other people think about you. Uh, it's really nice and freeing and liberating when you do that. Uh. So that's really what that is about. And the same thing with entertainment. Uh, Entertainment draws you into the world, yeah, and it makes it gives all of these interests outside. So the idea of uh, giving up your mobile phone, I think, is a really good idea, huh? very excellent idea. Huh? So well done, Shell, for uh, 
for that, that uh, I'm not sure who that, where they come from, but you are organizing it, which is actually what matters. So excellent. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, so I think, you know, maybe this is what we should do all the time. Maybe we should give up our mobile phones. Is that possible? Is there anyone here who doesn't have a mobile phone? Huh? No, no, everyone has a mobile phone. Okay, it's, it's that difficult, right, to live without a mobile phone. Actually, I don't have a mobile phone, but I, I'm kind of, maybe, Ajahn Brahm doesn't have a mobile phone, right? Uh, isn't that kind of nice? Huh? No mobile phone. Huh? That's kind of, kind of good. Uh, I have a laptop, though, I have to admit, uh, so I'm not, <laughs> not, not as pure as I may, may kind of make it out. Uh. <laughs> um, so that is the uh, idea of no entertainment. Again, drawing the mind within, uh, yeah, and enjoying what we have. And the entertainment uh, that is suitable for a meditator uh, is uh, nature, uh, right? Uh, so if you need something more than just sitting in meditation, if you need something else, go out for a walk. Uh, it's so beautiful around you, especially now when the sun is coming out. Uh, Last time we were here, we had lots of sun. So if we have, we see how good our kama is. If we have good kama, we might get a lot of sun this time as well. We see how things go. And so go for walks. And nature is kind of peaceful. Nature doesn't draw your mind out. Nature doesn't make you attached and full of desires. Yeah, it actually has the opposite effect usually. In the suttas and in the Theragata, Theragata, the verses of the elder monks and the nuns, they always talk about how they enjoy nature. Yeah, so these are arahants and they enjoy nature. If arahants can enjoy nature, you too can enjoy nature. Yeah. <laughs> so please do that, and you know, and then have cups of tea when you feel like it. And uh, if you ever feel a bit tense and stressed out and not enjoying yourself, and something doesn't go right, don't force yourself. Uh, find something else. Uh, go for a walk. Go back to your room. Lie down for a while. Uh, if you have a book in your room, you're allowed to read in your room, so then you can read something or do something, yeah, to relax, uh, have a cup of tea. All of these kind of things are there for that. Just a bit of walking meditation, uh, and etc., etc. Et we'll talk a bit more about how to do these meditations uh, later on. Uh. And then there's the last one, which is sleeping on a simple bed. I don't know the beds here, whether they qualify simple or not, but they are, they are fine. Yeah, don't worry too much about that. I think that they are, they are good enough. Uh, and so we just use the beds that are there, uh, and then we uh, 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 deal with that. Uh, in, uh, so maybe we have kind of seven and a half precepts, I'm not sure. But anyway, <laughs> I think that's fine. Uh, so those are the precepts for you. So are you, anyone now wants to retract the taking of the precepts? So are you, are you still okay with them? <laughs> Is that all right? Uh, wow, you are a dedicated bunch. That's good. Huh? I'm really, that's good. Excellent. Huh? So that is the, uh, the idea of the uh, precepts. Uh, and uh, 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 as far as the actual content of the retreat, uh, is concerned that I'm going to be focusing, as I always do, on the word of the Buddha. Uh, to me, the word of the Buddha has a very special place in Buddhism. Uh, and I have always found that I feel there's too much emphasis on teachers and gurus uh, and these kind of things in Buddhism, uh, and not enough on the Buddha. And uh, it, which is kind of paradoxical, because the Buddha himself, we know that he said that uh, after his passing away, uh, the teachings uh, what we should use to inspire us, uh, what we should use as our guidelines after his passing away are his teachings. Uh, and the first thing we forget is precisely that. Uh, yeah. This is kind of how things, this is kind of the history of mankind, I think. Yeah. And we kind of, and we go different ways. Uh, and so we always need to kind of, it, it, I think one of the kind of interesting aspects of Buddha's history is this kind of recurring theme of going back to the source uh, material. Uh, yeah, you do this your way for a while, you go back to the source. You do this your way for a while, you go back to the source. Uh, the kind of the forest traditions and the uh, early Buddhist tradition. This is not a modern thing. This has happened throughout Buddhist history. Uh, you have in the early days of Buddhist history, you have a, a school called the uh, Sotrantika school. And Sotrantika means the Sutta practitioners, right? Uh, and that was very early on, maybe a couple of hundred years after the Buddha. These were already emerging as schools uh, because already they were deviating. Yeah? They were creating the Abhidhamma and these kind of other exciting projects. Uh, but wait a minute, uh, well, maybe we should go back to the word of the Buddha. Yes, go back to the word of the Buddha. And we're still trying to do that. So it's never going to happen fully. It's just kind of this thing you always have to do. Uh, and the reason why the word of the Buddha is so important uh, is because if there is one person uh, in the history of Buddhism that we have to assume had some special insight, uh, it is the Buddha. Yeah, it is, if, if there's one single one, it has to be the Buddha. Because if the Buddha didn't have a special insight into reality, we have a big problem there. 
Yeah, because the Buddha, his insight is what supports everything else. Everything else in the history of Buddhism is based on that idea. Everything we teach, everything we practice, everything. Yeah. And so if the Buddha didn't have it right, then we have a very, very serious problem and everything collapses like a house of cards. Yeah. So um, for that reason, uh, the word of the Buddha should always be the standard uh, by which everything else is measured. Uh, all other teachers, all other writings, Abhidhamma, commentaries, Mahayana suttas, late suttas, uh, all of these things. Uh, and I am not uh, a Theravadan chauvinist, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I, because I don't even really consider myself, you know, I, you can call me Theravada monk if you like, but what I consider myself is more like a disciple of the Buddha. Uh, and Theravada means much more than that. Uh, so, you know, so, so we don't need to make these divisions between Theravada and Mahayana at, at all, actually. Uh, we can just make, come to some agreement that we all respect the Buddha, and we do all respect the Buddha. So what does that mean? Okay, it means, okay, we take the suttas, uh, the word of the Buddha, as primary here. Uh, and I think that is a way we can actually find a lot of meeting ground between all schools of Buddhism, and we don't have to divide so much between each other here. So, my time is up. So, uh, <laughs> I'm following the schedule here, bang, on, on the dot. So, uh, we have a 10 minute break, just if you wish to have a, use a toilet or stretch your legs a little bit, please do so, and we come back for a short guided meditation at uh, 8.30 here. So first of all, just uh, sit down, uh, and you're sitting already, which is good. Uh, and uh, make sure that you are comfortable where you're sitting. Uh, you want to get the body out of the way, so it doesn't cause you any problems. Uh, there is really very little chance of indulging the body uh, when you sit like this, so don't worry about that. Uh, much more important to worry about not torturing the body. Uh, so you want to be at ease, you want to be relaxed, you don't want to be in pain. So make sure you are, you are sitting comfortably. Uh, whatever posture that is, the posture is not so important. Uh, what matters is that the body can kind of fade into the background. And uh, then you want to make sure that you are at ease, that you don't have any tensions or uh, anything like that, uh, but you feel really nice and relaxed. Uh, and it's usually important to take as much time as you require uh, to feel really relaxed. Uh, the more you relaxed you feel, uh, the more likely that uh, the meditation will go well. Uh, and very often uh, the relaxation happens uh, simply from waiting. Uh, allowing the world to kind of fade into the background and fade away from your mind. Uh, and as you do that, uh, things tend to become more easy. Uh, the breathing becomes nice and natural, uh, and you feel a sense of ease as a consequence. Uh, so take your time uh, and just kind of allow things to fade away. Uh, and just having a sense of good feeling about being on this retreat, having a chance to practice the spiritual life. Uh, and what a wonderful an opportunity that is. Uh,
And uh, please take it very slowly on this retreat. Uh, there is no urgency, we're not actually going anywhere. Uh, so just enjoy whatever you have from the very beginning. Uh, and remember that when you start out here, uh, there's a lot of momentum from the past. Uh, thinking, perception, ideas that will arise. Uh, and so just be very patient with yourself uh, and allow these things just to die down by themselves. Uh, give them time to gently disappear. Uh, and uh, initially, uh, don't have any judgments about yourself or your mind or the content of your mind. Uh, everything is okay here. Uh, just try to be aware of what is happening here. Uh, and as you are gently aware of what is happening within and without, uh, then things gradually start to fade away here. Uh. You don't really need to do anything at all during this meditation. Huh? All you need to do is really just have that sense that the mind uh, wants to be peaceful, huh? that the mind inclines towards peace. Huh? And when the mind inclines towards peace, uh, the process is largely automatic. Uh, you just have to wait uh, and the peace will arise all by itself. Huh? If you feel that you need some object, something to help you with the peace, uh, and very often uh, just uh, simply having an awareness of your posture. Uh, 
just an awareness that you're sitting here uh, and just feeling the body in a very general sense, uh, just to have a bit of an anchor if you like. Uh, but don't force this, uh, don't use any willpower. Uh, if the mind wants to run a bit right in the beginning, uh, please allow it to do so. Uh, and gradually the mind will calm down by itself. Uh, but please wait with the breath meditation, uh, because you need to establish that mindfulness first of all. Uh, then when the mindfulness is clear enough, uh, the breath tends to arise by itself. Uh,
And uh, as you start to calm down and become peaceful, uh, please notice the pleasure of that peaceful mind. Uh, because noticing the good qualities of meditation uh, will encourage you. Uh, so always look for those positive outcomes that you have on the path. Uh, and as you do that, uh, the whole process uh, will have more power and more effect. Uh.
Okay, so coming close to the end, uh, uh, before we come to the very end, uh, just take a few moments to reflect back on your meditation. Uh, and if you do feel that you are a bit more peaceful and at ease and uh, more mindful or whatever, uh, then always ask yourself at the end why that is the case. Uh, Okay, so that is the um, end of the meditation uh, for now. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, as a finishing off, it might be nice to just uh, pay homage to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, do the Arahan Samha Sambuddha together. Uh, so uh, let's uh, do that, and if you want to carry on with your meditation afterwards, please, uh, please feel free to do so, of course. Uh, Sangha Namah